Well, hello and good afternoon from a wonderful dog patch labs in Dublin. I'm Mike Wilson. I'm your host for Blockchain Connect Dublin, and I'm delighted to invite, be joined today by a panel with uh, Jack Fanuk and Clark from Enterprise Ireland and Eve Messi from R3, who are my guests this afternoon about meeting the investors. So, uh, good afternoon, Jack. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody, and Hi. everybody online. And good afternoon, Eve. Good afternoon from London. So, um, okay, I, I, let me kind of scene set first. I'll, I'll, I'll have Jack and Eve, first of all, introduce themselves and then introduce their companies. Then I'll set a scene about some of the stuff we're going to talk about this afternoon. There'll be plenty of time for audience q and A. I I know we've got a, a mixed, mixed audience of, of, of folk both online and in the room who are either studying, embarking, creating their own startup or in more established firms. And we hope to help all of you kind of demystify about meeting the investors. So if I start with Eve online, Eve, if you'd be so kind as to introduce yourself, introduce the role you play at R3, and we'll come back a little to talk about R3 in a moment, just yourself and the role you play at R3, and then I'll hand over to Jack for a similar introduction. Excellent, sounds good. Hello guys, I'm Eve Messi. I'm a blockchain engineer at uh, R3 in EMEA. I focus on capital markets, capital markets, infrastructure, insurance, and digital asset projects, some of which you may have seen in um, the likes of Cointelegraph. Um, my specialty really involves building financial markets and insurance infrastructure with tier one, um, usually listed entities in, in Europe for R3. Fantastic, thank you. And Jack, an introduction to yourself, please. Yep. You Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jack Fanukin Clark. I'm with Enterprise Ireland. And um, for those of you who don't know, we um, invest and support uh, businesses here in Ireland. And my role uh, as an overseas market advisor is I'm based in the UK. And we help those companies scale up their exports and operations in various different uh, in various different territories. We have 41 overseas offices at the moment. Oh, great. And hi, I'm Mike Wilson. Um, thank, thank you, Jack and Eve. Just a little bit about my background. I'm the founder and CEO of Ditto. We're a B2B tech marketing practice. We help firms scale. We help them get investor ready. We help them get them revenue ready. Uh, we launched a practice in 2008. For the 20 years prior to that, I was involved in emerging tech VC uh, internationally in Asia and New York in Bankers Trust and Deutsche Bank. And so I've spent a kind of 30 year career in emerging tech, helping tech companies grow. So, so a little bit about what we're going to do this afternoon. Um, we wanted to have meet the investors, an interesting Venn diagram here between the work that Enterprise Ireland do and the work that R3 do. Some of it overlaps and kind of sits in the middle. Some, some of it doesn't, it's adjacent. But we thought it'd be great to get a market perspective of what these firms do and how they help invest in companies, invest in ideas and help them scale. So, so I think, first of all, for those that maybe don't know who R3 are, if Eve, if you just introduce R3, your kind of a little kind of part of history in the background and the work that R3 do in, in the blockchain infrastructure world, Eve. Absolutely, absolutely. So R3 is a blockchain, an enterprise blockchain software company. Uh, it started about four to five years ago now during uh, the years of the rise of Bitcoin, really. And the rise of Bitcoin really spurred a lot of questions among some of the world's biggest, most regulated financial services institutions. And they got together a research and development lab that became R3SEV uh, that focused on applying the lessons of Bitcoin um, to what maybe what we think financial markets will look like by 2030. So since then, we've evolved from being a research and development lab to being an enterprise software company that essentially maintains an open source blockchain called Corda that enables listed financial services institutions and increasingly insurers, telecoms, trade finance and insurance solutions um, to essentially move on to blockchain in a safe, regulated and, and, and resilient way. Excellently, but so Eve is going to talk to us a little bit. Very on there, me not to be heard. Can you hear me? Oh, that's better. I beg your pardon. So Eve is going to talk a little bit about how R3 help startups and how R3 have an infrastructure in place in the R3 Venture Fund. So Jack, Enterprise Ireland, big, huge company. People know it from, from butter to, to, um, uh, to, to, to food production to technology. A little bit about what you do in Enterprise Ireland that would be great. Yeah, sure. So um, I am part of a team that's based in the UK. We are 18 at the moment. Um, we are divided up sort of by uh, industry segments. So my area would be fintech and financial services. 
And the role is really about helping Irish companies make that journey. Um, so either the first steps on their exporting journey or uh, if they're already uh, selling into the UK market on how they can scale up those uh, exports. Um, the sort of the logic behind it uh, is that the more exports a company has, the more people that they're going to employ domestically here. Um, so that's sort of the, the thinking behind um, why we are who we are. My colleague, uh, Paul Garrity, is here in the audience as well. He looks after the digital tech portfolio. Um, and yeah, that's the day to day is really about helping helping businesses understand the UK market better. Um, and that can be anything from helping them develop a, a kind of a uh, sales pipeline um, to positioning them to product market fit work or some of the early stage companies and um, we run an accelerator program that Mike helps us out with um, and yeah the, the the role is quite varied in terms of how we how we help companies we'll have to swap microphones here could someone swap that microphone now please um, this one here. The um, I'd like to start with talking about Davos, which sounds very glamorous. I know Eve went to Davos but couldn't come to Dublin, so just make out of that what you will. But but Eve, what caught your eye at Davos in blockchain? We've heard a lot this morning about smart cities, smart citizens. We then talked about new digital economies, but what is catching the eye of investors in, in Davos and blockchain? And just explain to our audience here in the room and online the whole Davos story of blockchain would be great. Of course. So, so that's a very good question. I personally have been attending um, at Davos for the past two, three years in a row now, and I've seen the transition from the crazy years of Bitcoin at thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars to Bitcoin at three thousand dollars, back to what we have now, and and sort of what the Davos crowd has sort of reacted to and and made up of that of that kind of momentum. And what I've noticed this year specifically is that. Uh, platforms like Hyperledger, platforms like Corda, platforms like digital asset holdings, um, enterprise blockchain essentially is a lot more interesting to investors in this context compared to two to three years before. There is a sense that uh, the, the crypto story, however fascinating and, and however sort of ebullient it was at the time, is no longer what the real promise of blockchain really presents when it comes to business. Um, and, and you could see this in a number of startups being present. Joe Lubin of Consensus was present, of course. Uval of Digital Assets was present. We had a presence for, from our three. And um, it's very interesting seeing some of the more established corporates, you know, the traditional industries like packaging, like uh, utilities, like consumer goods, now looking at blockchain very seriously and essentially in Davos having meetings related to this, um, at least for this year. Thank you. And, and Eve, I want to pick a kind of lift Davos up and drop in the Dublin and drop it into Enterprise. So Davos does a huge amount of momentum around enterprise blockchain, a huge amount of momentum globally around investment. Maybe there's folk in the room or online that have an idea and, and, and would like to kind of get that idea off the ground locally here and um, and to to look for it to, to kind of support to enterprise iron provider maybe jack if you just talk about how you get an idea from the whiteboard to the boardroom for enterprise iron how you might help those startups yes so um enterprise iron will actively sort of encourage uh, entrepreneurs domestically here in ireland so if you do have a, an idea that you think is going to be um you know the making of you or or the next big thing uh, get in touch with Enterprise Ireland. There are various different ways in which uh, you can be helped. So there are things like the Competitive Start Fund. Um, there is HPSU Investment, which is the High Potential Startup. Um, that's for companies who um, you're predicting that you're going to employ 10 people in Ireland um, and projecting a turnover of about a million euro within three years. So those are the kind of criteria that and you're looking for obviously with uh, blockchain technologies it's slightly more um, ambiguous shall we say so um, I think a few years ago there was a flurry of companies that came to market uh, we invested in a number of them um, and those have had various different degrees of success I suppose it, it boils down to how we would measure success so our, um, as I mentioned before, the, the, the fundamental purpose for our existence is to help increase employment, right? So uh, employment through overseas trade. Um, if you look at the companies that Enterprise Ireland has invested in, um, they are employing people in Ireland at the moment. And those are, um, you know, quite 
tech intensive roles, I suppose, for want of a better phrase. Um, so we would see that as, as, as a type of success. Now those companies um, will have different um, levels of success when it comes to revenue, but from our perspective, um, we are, I suppose, incubating and, and honing those jobs here within this market. So that's, that's where we are with it. Look, I want to pick up on that too. Thank you very much, um, um, Eve and Jack. So, so, so we hear from a Davos world stage, I think like there's a billion dollars earmarked for enterprise blockchain. There's a sense of it that side. There's a sense of great excitement to technology. But I'd like maybe Eve, if you could just help our audience illustrate a couple of startups that have been a success, because I think we all think there could be success, but we struggle to articulate one or find one, particularly around the commercial model and particularly around the revenue generative elements to it. So, so Eve, maybe if you want to share with our audience, you know, particularly if it's on a core network, that's great. It's something that you would point to and say, you know, there's a really great startup that fixes a real world problem. And that's why um, it's a good reference point for people to think about um, um, when when starting a firm, over to of you. Of course. So, so in the context of blockchain, I think you really have to look at R three as uh, an ecosystem where you know if you're able to move past the story of crypto and see how distributed ledger can actually shift the pace and and, and cadence of business, the nature of our workflows in production. That's what we're really driving at. So, an example would be a company like B3i in Zurich. And B3i is a consortium of dozens of some of the world's largest insurance companies who decided to run a number of insurance smart contracts together to automate a lot of their usual workflows and gain on efficiencies. So B3i, um, as covered in Cointelegraph and some of the other Financial Times and, and other international headlines, is a startup that delivers that efficiency, is able to engage with these corporate players, roll out this technology, manage the complexity of uh, complexities of integrating you know, with legacy systems in each of these insurance companies and deliver what's starting to be in Q2, value added services, right? Like added lines of insurance entirely automated on blockchain on a consortium basis. So th this would be one of the startups that I would point you to initially. And then there are several like SDX in uh, Switzerland, who's a part of the Swiss Stock Exchange group of companies. And they're essentially a tokenized variant of the entire Swiss um, securities trading ecosystem. And they're also about to go live in a few months as well. That would be another example of someone using, um, having a DLT innovation, engaging with large corporates, rolling out a complex politically and technologically piece of technology and, and getting to the point of value where they can talk about revenue generation and licensing fees in, in a short amount of time. Thank you, Ivan. I kind of want to pass the same question to, to Jacket Enterprise Ireland. So, you know, what has been on your radar here to throw a spotlight on blockchain success stories or blockchain firms at Enterprise Ireland caught your eye, even if they haven't kind of become the unicorn yet? But what caught your eye in Enterprise Ireland in blockchain investment and why? Um, so I must caveat this in the beginning by saying that, um, you know, if you rewind the clock back to 1997 and so the dawn of, of the World Wide Web and, and the internet as it was. Um, there were pioneers who tried to do things who didn't actually make that much money in the beginning. Um, and now business models are completely sort of designed around the use of the internet technology. So um, I still think that we are in a pioneering phase with this technology in terms of business models and what we can use uh, the technology for. Um, that said, I, I suppose, the two things that have caught my eye with it, um, so I'll give you one in an Irish context and one perhaps in a, in a um, wider international context. Um, there is a company called AidTech, who some of you may or may not have heard of, um, who are using DLT to try and add a level of transparency when it comes to uh, the distribution of um, aid that's given state aid, uh, international aid, um, and more recently, I think there's an innovation there in terms of charity donations. So um, you will actually be able to trace where your money goes, and the and the thinking is that that will reduce corruption um, and the wastage of money. So that's a really sort of big picture um, way that that could really kind of change the world in a positive sort of a way. Um, the the issue there, I suppose, is is uptake, and um, you know it takes a long time to get stakeholders uh, invested in in such a, a type of technology or an innovation. So um, 
so this, from an Irish context, I think that that company is quite interesting, um, and certainly keep an eye out for them uh, in the next couple of years because I think that they are starting to make tracks uh, internationally. I think if you look at something like um, maybe trade or project finance, where you have maintenance covenants in in contracts. Um, that's where you know step one is complete, so step two can begin type thing. Um, I think that's a, an area where there could really be a good use for for distributed ledger technology. Uh, I know ING Bank, who are one of the larger banks internationally for trade finance, had a project where they're trying to do it. Um, but again, I go back to the point that it's we're still in a pioneering phase. So what we think the business model is now. So um, I think. Um, Eve mentioned a, a licensing fee. Uh, I think a lot of companies are trying to figure out the revenue model for something like that. Um, so I think that that is, is still kind of evolving at the moment. Um, so from an investor perspective, you're sort of investing in the, the abstract a little bit more um, than you would be with typical sort of digital. Thank you. Let's, let's dig a little bit deeper and I'm going to go back to Eve. So, so Eve kind of wearing your R3 app, but wearing your experience at looking at so many folk coming onto your ecosystem there, you know, what are the three things that you see in an idea? Do you think this is really going to fly? You know, when, when folk are coming in to pitch to you, when folk are coming in to leverage your network and be part of the R3 network, what are the three things that are front of mind that need to be there to demonstrate to you guys that this, that this is a winner? That, that's a bit of a tricky one um, because, of course, uh, I do have to mention that uh, as R3 as a platform, we really aim to be more like the Android of the global um, financial system slash uh, fintech ecosystem. What this means is that we, we're not quite allowed to pick winners, right? We try to work with all partners quite equally. Um, but there are some things that we filter for, of course. We want to make sure uh, we do have a lot of companies that essentially maybe attempt to join the network mainly because of the ecosystem and the potential clients they can have. But that doesn't generally generate value for for a lot of them. We want to see something that we haven't seen before, something that um, like an innovation that makes a new type of dynamic possible, either in adding liquidity, either in simplifying custody, either in simplifying onboarding to blockchain, um, maybe in simplifying access to a new type of market or a market that's been there, um, but has maybe been accessible to the vast majority of financial players because of. Of, uh, of, of the cost involved, and maybe blockchain is the reason why this is now accessible, right? Going back to the SDX example, they're tokenizing assets that are worth trillions and that weren't really available to the average investor. And when they go live, you'll see exactly um, that coming into place. So to get back to answering your question specifically, we like um, enablers and people who assist onboarding onto blockchain easily, effortlessly, um, and people who make new verticals possible that we haven't seen before fantastic so, so um yeah i love the liquidity because to the onboarding access and the onboarding and i guess for r3 that's great because you want to adopt you want r3 to be the the kind of operating system i guess for, for, for this piece so, so this but i know we can talk about in the context of blockchain jack but i think there's an adjacency here of maybe folks that isn't blockchain too but are emerging tech and and you know, I, I'd love to maybe the top three things that are front of Enterprise Ireland's mind or your own mind when it when it when a pitch comes in. And what are the three winning things that you want to see, leaving aside blockchain for a moment? But, but I think that people can learn from what makes it what makes a great idea a super idea and fly, and what makes it investor ready. Uh, okay, well that's a, an interesting question, I suppose. Um, as I mentioned before, the the employment piece is very important for for EI. Um, we are actively trying to encourage things like female entrepreneurship. Uh, so I believe last year Enterprise Ireland invested in was it 45 businesses that were run by women, um, which is a record I believe, um, and that's something that we're looking to to continue. And that's not necessary. That doesn't predicate whether the business is going to be a success or not, um, but that is an initiative that um, that we think is very important, and, and th that diversity piece is quite important um, as part of our strategy. Um, I think the the most important thing um, for any of you out there who are looking to come to Enterprise Ireland is, you know, if you are using very nascent technology, you really need to have a compelling case to explain to the investment committee 
why this is going to be beneficial for them to invest in it. Um, the investment committee with Enterprise Ireland, the people come from quite a diverse uh, range of backgrounds. And I know when it comes to things like anything to do with crypto, there is a little bit of um, maybe an apprehensive apprehension there that um, uh, they don't want to invest in something that would be perhaps deemed as as too risky um, going forward. While we still want to encourage entrepreneurship, um, you have to sort of show that this will, you know, that there's a, a well thought out. A good business plan is 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 essential for that, um, but I would say the for any prospective um, entrepreneurs out there who are thinking about it, there is a a, a function within Enterprise Ireland known as the Development Advisor, a DA, uh, and these guys are really really good adept at being that conduit between the business and the investment committee. Uh, so they will work with you on making sure that your your pitch is correct uh, and that your value proposition is sort of well defined, um, which a lot of people kind of fall down at the beginning. Well, I, I'll share my own if I may. Thank, thank you, Jack. Thank you. So, so we help firms get market ready, and we help firms get investor ready. And, and I'm going to borrow an expression that Paulie and Jack would have many times from from our colleagues at Deloitte. A key winning thing when we companies come in front of us that we'll think key, they're going to fly, is when they really fall in love with the problem, not the solution. So, so if you want to start a company, you really got to love the problem. And, and I think that's the very first thing I would say when, it, when I, we're kind of picking kind of riders and runners and winners in the space. So love the problem, not the solution, number one. Yeah. Number two thing, I think what really demonstrates to us is the ability to sell. You know, and, and yes, a an minimal viable product, but what do you mean by selling? So, so, so we pick the winners by folk who know how to price their product, who folk have got a sense who's going to buy it and why, and, and, and a sense of what problem they're solving. And then the third thing I think is that they're, they're absolutely burningly ambitious with a, with a business plan, both of you guys mentioned, you know, but the planning is key. You know, they've got a great sense on the step functions they need to take. They've got a good sense of who their competitors are. You know, they're not trying to be a unicorn, you know, well, they all want to be unicorns, but they're not trying to be a wall. They're trying to get that. So, so I think that's, that's for me, those kind of three winning traits. I'm now, of course, having asked for the three winning traits, want to ask for the three things that are no-nos and things to avoid if you're sitting down in front of the, um, the investor committee. Whether or not, Eve, this is our three saying no, or just in your experience working in the market. Eve, if you were to give recommendations to folk who, who, who are starting firms, what would be the three things to avoid? I think um, from, from an R3 perspective, and you know what, this is not just R3, this is from an enterprise blockchain investing perspective. One thing that we've seen is, listen, there is one deal breaker usually that happens where you have a groundbreaking idea for, let's say, the future of liquidity using blockchain, but you also, you haven't researched the industry, you don't, you haven't engaged with any of the existing companies involved. Um, and it, if you get a sense that essentially you haven't done your research in terms of who is in the industry you're trying to disrupt, that's an immediate uh, deal breaker. Another major no-no is when we hear blockchain, AI, IoT, and maybe let's be funny here, but genomics involving the one pitch deck. That's obviously another non-starter because clearly um, someone is uh, putting a lot of buzzwords together, right? Without necessarily a, a concrete plan to make the company valuable. And the last one for us would be absence of a business model. You know, you could have the best technology on the planet, but if you have no idea about what your go-to-market looks like and the cost of customer acquisition involved then you shouldn't be speaking to investors to raise funds. Um, I hope that's not too harsh, but that's kind of the three main realities we've seen so far. Oh, fantastic. So be engaged, understand your research, avoid all the buzzword bingo, and you have a viable business model. So, so, so similarly then, Jack, for yourself, you know, and you sit in hundreds of pitches, you meet hundreds of firms, you know, constantly between your work that you guys do across the eye. What are the three teams that kind of put your head in your hands, you know? Yeah, I, I'd actually go along with um, what Eve mentioned there in terms of understanding the competitive environment of where you're going into. Uh, I think um, if I can anecdotally use an example from the Accelerator program that we ran last year in London where um, this company came in and said they wanted to sell to financial services and you're kind of scratching your head going, you know that's a vast uh, you know market there's various different sort of subsections within that market and it's just too vague you know that's sort of an annoying thing to be confronted with because you realize that they don't really know who they're selling to and um, by virtue of that fact they don't know who their competitors are in that space 
Um, and that's just, it seems to me, that's kind of like the bread and butter stuff that you should really be focused on in the very, very beginning. Um, but you'd be surprised the amount of companies that aren't. Uh, so I'd say that, that fundamentally, that's probably the most important one um, uh, from my perspective. I think from ours, our, um, you know, we work with loads of owner-managed businesses and there's something about owner-managed firms that uh, is really exciting and also a real pain that's difficult, but I absolutely love them. I, I'm passionately about them. So if it was to give three things we've seen as traits that uh, people get in the way of their own success, I, I think the first one is valuation. And people have really sometimes have a very overblown sense of how they value their worth and value the firm. They're a bit nervous about investor conversations. They're a bit nervous around that piece are unrealistic. So I think that's the, that's a great first one, getting a sense on your worth and value and what that means. Um, number two is three things. You got to network, network, and network. You I mean you really do? And there's no excuse not to network. Look at this event here today, so well attended, online and physically, the meetups. You know, you really have to. And both Jack and and he mentioned about the engagement piece and research and engagement. And, all. and then the third thing is keep it real. Uh, people can smell a BS a mile away. You know, if you're kind of chasing opportunity rather than identifying it. You know, when you've got all of the kind of buzzword bingo and stuff. So I think that's what I would add as, as three things to um, to really avoid, really. Um, okay. Actually, sorry, just on yeah, that, yeah. I'll, touch, I'll touch on the keeping it real part. Um, so it's slightly out of context of blockchain, but um, very often people underestimate the sales cycle time that, think that, yeah. that things can take. And uh, particularly when you're dealing with large international investment banks or insurance companies, and the sales cycle can be upward of 18 months to two years and and a lot of startups actually don't have cash flow to to sort of see them out through that process so instead of hunting down you know the the big woolly mammoth maybe start with a rabbit yeah, <laughs> and start absolutely. getting some cash flow um, and i think that that's a, that's a common mistake yeah no, this is exactly i mean we had a conversation about this earlier with, with a company just yesterday actually and they're severely underestimated uh, the length of their sales cycle. So this is another uh, crucial one. I think my bit of advice that I would throw in that I've noticed um, is if you're, here's a piece of advice, if you're a founder in an industry that you haven't worked in before and that you're disrupting because you have a unique piece of technology, you, you would gain a lot by adding someone maybe from that industry in your board of advisors or on your team. I think that would add a lot of credibility because as someone who's not 30 yet, I have noticed that once you have someone who is maybe 40 to 50 years old and has a few decades of experience in a vertical in the same conversation, you're allowed to be as 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 millennial or or innovative and youthful as 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 you get to be without pretending to know more about the industry. You get that balance and credibility. So that's one piece of advice I would really throw in there. What about us guys who are over 50s, well into our 50s? Do we not get a look in even? Well, because yeah, I want. Way. It goes the other way. If you can add someone, um, an engineer who just understands a bit more about the different verticals and the latest, I think it's just a pair. You need complementarity to speak to the whole spectrum. And in enterprise blockchain specifically, right? if it's retail, you can go crypto um, C2B, right? essentially B2C, directly to your customers. You don't need that. But in enterprise, generally speaking, you have to speak the language and have a technology with a unique advantage. You can't get away with that either. Super. I, I want to finish on a bit of a high and talk about some winners because I know there's folk in the room here with maybe like some reference points of companies that I think are kind of interesting. So I want to give some quick winners. First of all, R3, check out BCP Group. They're absolutely fantastic. They're, they're a brokerage firm. I think they're going to be a new digital bank to just go regulated. Oh. They're a great firm in the Corda network. I think they're super. Check out Cobalt, Cobalt DL. They're not on the Corda network. They are, they're not a DLT. They're a shared ledger. We had the privilege of launching COBOL seven years ago. We actually named it. But it's a great post-trade FX platform that's um, a bank on consortia. So there's kind of two two winning firms that go have a quick look at what those guys are doing. I'm going to hand over to Eve. Got a couple, I know you mentioned SDX and B3, which are great. But a couple of other winning firms you'd like to highlight, Eve? I think a key one for us would be a company called Value on Chain, VOC. I think they recently rebranded to Valk, V-A-L-K. And they'd recently won the Swin's FinTech Awards in the distributed ledger category. And um, they, they're a very impressive team. They've generally understood that you need to engage with industry players, uh, no matter how millennial you are. Uh, and their product specifically has impressed us in terms of their technology. It's not, uh, they're, they're, so they're, they're, they're doing what they say they're doing. And unfortunately, that's not 
always obvious in crypto. Um, and generally speaking, we're really excited about where they're going. Other than that, I think a company like uh, RiskStream or a company like um, Voltron, for example, which is a trade finance consortium that just went live um, a, few, a few weeks ago, Voltron specifically, they may have rebranded to another name and you can follow up with um, anything I mentioned here on LinkedIn um, to have a further conversation. But Voltron is another key consortium that's successfully gone from um, idea to live product. The key word again, consortia. So a couple of winners from yourself, Jack. Sure, yeah. Um, I think um, Gecko Governance is an interesting uh, Irish company. Um, so they are based up on the border with Northern Ireland and do a lot of work with First Derivatives and KX. Um, and I saw Pete uh, Townsend outside, so I think you'd take my head off if I didn't mention Coinbase. Okay. <laughs> we've got time for some Q&A. Uh, now we've got, so Eve is super connected guy, R3, R3 Venture Fund, lots of stuff happening. We've got Jack here in the room. Is there any questions in the room, please, from the Dublin audience? Okay, we've got a question right at the back, please. Thank you. <laughs> you just say your name. Your name and what you're doing with your company, please. My name is Adik Benga Ogunbejebo. Everyone calls me Ben. You can also call me Ben. I think it's much easier. And uh, I am the founder of a startup, not in the blockchain space, but more to do with machine learning algorithms. But we potentially might be taking a business pivot model towards the blockchain. So my question is always with regards to how much of the blockchain technology to the enterprises you work with normally adopt because sometimes some people adopt five percent some adopt ten percent some identify themselves as total dlt or blockchain enterprises or companies where the whole operation is within the blockchain and some just use part and parcel of the technology i think that's a perfect question for eve so eve i think just ben's question was just in terms of blockchain dlt adoption how much is this fundamental and core to a firm's essence how much is a clip on to their day-to-day -day practice and what's your sense in that for ben i think it depends so because we deal with a lot of regulated financial institutions understandably uh, the blockchain portion of their business might amount to a grand two percent at best right because they have global operations but then that one percent or two percent can can be uh, huge like sdx again that i keep mentioning um, you also see a different dynamic where let's say that I'm a commercial lender, uh, commercial paper business is my mainstay, I'm a medium firm. What I'll do is I'll have a blockchain ghost to my existing way of functioning with a startup's help. And then eventually the plan announced to the board will be to switch to the blockchain version that is more efficient, faster, uh, more value generating. So it's either a parallel lane, a micro portion of huge entities, or a dedicated DLT player, like um, I would say Global Cap, for example, who's a private equity player entirely on DLT. Uh, and there are new species of company. But to answer your question, Ben, it's usually either both at the same time, a small portion of a huge entity, or a dedicated um, blockchain company in a new market. We at the stage yes of maturity, we can talk about blockchain natives. It's quite mad, isn't it? Any other questions? Or is there a question there from the lady there? Hi, uh, my name is Katrina Sheridan and I'm the founder of an organization called Nefasi. So what we've done is we've blockchained the venturing process in emerging markets and really tapped into the global giving market, which is about a trillion market. Uh, so we're using blockchain technology to provide transparency, efficiency, effectiveness uh, in uh, bringing uh, what is charitable money or uh, to trace that money and how it's been used in the venturing process. And in addition to that, we've also taken mentoring. So um, taking mentoring capacity from Global North to provide that in the Global South. So uh, we actually traveled with um, the Minister uh, of um, Business and Innovation in Ireland to Africa recently. So it's, it's really a new era of sustainable development and our ultimate uh, outcomes is about job creation and African entrepreneurs having access to the global market. So my question is, uh, we're a social enterprise, we're about blockchain for good. 
and we've heard a lot about impact investing and uh, you know earlier we had a great discussion around the whole era of you know how does blockchain take flight and i i suppose um uh, i would say to you we've built a an absolute product it's it i'm an enterprise ireland mentor as well so i know what good business models are um so what i would say to you is blockchain and its capacity to redistribute uh, and its capacity uh, for a sustainable development world and around, I suppose, looking at a broader capitalment enable, enablement of the world is huge. Um, and so I, I suppose what I'd like to see and explore is how can we uh, create more impact investing in this space, which I think is, is, so, is for everyone, for climate change, for yep. uh, you know issues like coronavirus, we see in you know we're dealing with today. So it's about blockchain for good because actually that is where the real value of blockchain is going to be. It's going to have some gains, obviously, in the for-profit market, but actually the bigger impact is around really good, effective, and efficient use of money, really good traceability on how things are being used and ultimately creating responsibility in terms of, you know, certainly in the whole aid and development space, how that money is used and making sure it's maximized at the intervention stage. And that applies to governments. That's very, it applies to all that's of very and all That's very interesting. Uh, you're essentially preaching to the choir. I happen to be on the global CSR committee 403, and I'm pushing for an initiative called Corda for SDGs specifically. Um, and I've written a book on this topic, Sustainable Finance, and I'm really happy that you're looking at using blockchain to, to make access to finance work better. If you could reach out later through LinkedIn or my email is eves.messi at r3.com, um, I would be more than happy to make this a reality on Corda as well um, with your assistance, but that sounds right up my alley. God, fantastic. Look at Great that. I, I think that's wonderful, isn't it? Listen, I, I, we got to wrap this session up, unfortunately, but what I want to do, I, I want to hand over first to Jack. If there's one thing that we discussed today you'd like the audience to take away from the discussion, what would it be? Um, I suppose from my perspective, the one thing would be that if there are uh, entrepreneurs out there, business ideas, that our doors are always open. Um, you can connect with me. I can share my details with you or uh, my colleague, Ulrich Arity, is there as well. Um, and yeah, you know, we're here to, to encourage and to nurture these types of businesses Super. in Ireland. Eve, if there's one thing you'd like the audience from everything we discussed today to take away from the discussion today, what would it be? I think the one thing is uh, you need to remember that R3 uh, and Corda specifically, yes, we started as a blockchain for bankers, quotes, uh, but this is very much changing. And what this means is that startups, if you have an interesting idea, do not hesitate to reach out and see how much assistance you can get. Because uh, that's something that we're very much ramping up. The first thing to do is to reach out and, and see what happens next. And then what we see next is that there are resources online we'll make available to you as you as you look more into what R3 is doing. Wonderful. Well, it just leaves it for me to, to really um, thank Jack, thank Eve, thank, you, thank you, Katrina for such a wonderful question. And thank you guys for participating. I really hope you enjoyed the session. Would you please put your hands together to thank my panel? Thank you. I should say that this session is being recorded with all the usual jibber jabbers and published and all that. And um, I'm looking forward now to heading into the round table sessions. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.